You're listening to the Cynic Radio Podcast. Now, your hosts, Igri and Cynic. And you are listening to the Cynic Radio Podcast. And I'm your host, Cynic. And joining me, as always, my co host and the third and fourth runner up on American Ninja Warrior this year, Igri and Ryan. And on this week's show, we review the amazing Season 2, Episode 1, Ozark, entitled Reparations. And we also talk about what could have been as we give our thoughts and our prayers to the mess that is Happy Time Murders. All that in a little news, because we are the Cynic Radio Podcast. Like, listen, subscribe. Most importantly, enjoy the show. One of Netflix's biggest original hits is back. It's referred to Jason Bateman's Breaking Bad. Accountant Marty Bird walks the razor's edge all of season one, where he launders money, he has to deal with the Mexican cartel, but he also has to deal with the local criminal element and the FBI. Will this runaway Netflix hit suffer the sophomore slump? Let's find out as we review Season 2, Episode 1, Reparations. Now, I don't know about you guys, but in my opinion, Ozark was one of the best shows of 2017, where they kind of left us hanging in a big way. Were you a fan of Season 1? Oh, it's one of the best written and acted shows around, and and it's the, the only comparison of Breaking Bad that I see on it is that well, there's two comparisons, is that it's well acted and that it's well written. And, you know, I mean, yeah, it is a crime drama, but, you know, it's a completely, it's more of a white collar crime, but it's still a good thinker and it plays to all audiences because they take this this person and these this family, really, and run them out of Chicago and into the Ozarks where, you know, some of the people are what the prototypical Ozark family would be like, you know, but it's also showing the, the beauty of the area it's it's beautifully shot. I mean, the production value on this show is amazing. And season one was really, really good. And season two so far has not let me down. Yeah, I'm almost to the end. And it kind of reminds me of the perfect storm between Breaking Bad, House of Cards, because of the dynamic of the family and Deliverance because of the setting. I uh, I enjoyed season one immensely. I couldn't wait for it to come back. And it's just one of those things where... He has so many balls in the air. He's juggling so much, and it's just interesting to watch them slide from one predicament to the next. So season one left us in a pretty big way. Uh, We're just kind of hanging because Darlene Snell decided it would be a great idea to kill Del, the point man for the Mexican cartel. At this point, IG, who is more of a threat to the birds? Is it the Snells that are local or the Mexican cartel? You know, that's a good question because I think the... uh the locals have shown the ability to make it look like you never existed in the first place. You know, the Mexican cartel just kind of by design generally wants to send a message when they're doing things. And the Snells just want to get rid of you completely. So I think they are by far the bigger threat. And they're the one that really needs to be paid attention. I've just sat down and went through three episodes and it's only getting better. Now, IG, Kevin Spacey shocked us when he started taking roles where he was kind of a jerk. It was like, oh my God, he started playing a bad guy. I mean, it started with American Beauty, and then it went to Horrible Bosses, and then House of Cards, and then we found out that maybe Kevin Spacey isn't acting. He's just being himself. Are we starting to see the same thing with Jason Bateman? I mean, if you saw the movie The Gift, he was a really bad guy. And then now there's this, and it's like, Jason Bateman is always likable. I mean, are we starting to see who he really is? Geez, I I really hope not, because, I mean, Jason Bateman's been around for a long time. Like, I mean, back into Teen Wolf 2, that was an awful movie, by the way. Don't go out of your way if you haven't seen it. But, I mean, there's been a lot of things that he's been in. He's been around for a long time, and he's generally more of a lighthearted actor. And I just really hope that it doesn't, turn into something like that because I and the thing is even in this like the reason I liked uh Kevin Spacey's character in House of Cards is because he was so slick about everything but the reason I mean there's still some kind of charm coming out of Jason Bateman in this one that isn't necessarily with how aptly he moves between things it's more just who Jason Bateman is and maybe I just can't see past uh some of the other things that he's done but I, I believe him in this role, so it's one of those things that I don't think 
that he's just not a good actor. I think the fact is, is that he's a very good actor and able to pull this off. Yeah, and I like how emotionally detached he is. I mean, there's openings for him to reach out and make it all better and soothe feelings, and he's just got nothing. And the character will literally just shut down and kind of grimace. And I love that. You can't drag Marty Bird out of his element. You can't make him be emotionally involved in the situation. He just gives you frank, quick responses, and it's like, oof. I mean, it could have been a lot better, and they even talk about it in a later episode where he's just not people-centric. There's this thing in Survivor and Big Brother where they call jury management, and that's basically when you send them to the jury house, do it nicely so you have a chance that they vote for you. And Marty doesn't do jury management well. Like, when he casts people off, it's just, see you later, pal. You know, uh, it was uh, fun working with you. I don't need you anymore. And when you're trying to avoid prosecution, that's probably not the best way to handle people of shady intent to begin with. And I love the advancement in storytelling because we never, ever got a story from the criminal point of view. You know, it was always the the cop trying to stop them or the good people trying to thrive while they're being uh, oppressed by the villain in the story. From beginning to end, the birds have been criminals, and that doesn't stop you from rooting for them. It doesn't stop you from wanting to see them come out of this okay, where we got th this element of Walter White, who was a good guy who turned bad. They were already broke bad pre-story. IG, do you like the way that the birds function as a, a team? I do, and they, they, they know that they're in trouble. They're looking for a way out of it, but they're okay with their spot. They're okay with what they've done, which is remarkable just that they're really looking to dig out of being bad by being bad and i think that's just an awesome way to tell a story and really if you kind of look at criminal thoughts basically that's how they work they continue to do things that are bad because they don't have another way out of it it's not like okay well you know, I went and robbed 12 liquor stores, so if I go and adopt an orphan, then everything evens out. No, you got to rob 12 liquor stores and then uh, steal an armored truck. You know, you got to move it up the notch, and that's what they keep doing. I mean, they're, they're finding new and inventive ways to try and find another way out of what they're doing. And it's, it's new. And I like the latest trend where we're getting it from the criminal side more than any other side. I mean, it started really with Breaking Bad. And then it's gone to other places, which is, it's just amazing. And it's such a refreshing take on ways to tell stories. I, I really am a big fan. Yeah, I am too. I, we cut to Darlene and Ash basically burying the cartel men out in the woods, which was a beautifully shot scene by the way they did the headlights and, and the lie of the body. And she finally admits after all this, maybe I shouldn't have killed these Mexicans, you think? IG, on a scale of one to Coke Zero... How badly did Darlene screw the pooch? Oh, my God. Like, pretty badly. It, this could go, like, it, it could go into the annals of time as one of the worst decisions ever made. But so far, you know, I mean, I don't know. They, they, things tend to work out for these people for I don't know why. Like, it just works. And it's, I think the comeuppance is coming. I, I, I'm not going to, I haven't gotten far into the season. I've only watched three episodes, so I don't have a lot of depth into it. But yeah, there's, th that's big time screwing the pooch. I mean, when you, when you start messing with a cartel, you just, you're messing with the wrong group of people. Yeah, and speaking of just casting done right, in a show full of dark characters, these two really stand out. Darlene's played by a, a journeyman actress named Lisa Emery, which I think she does an amazing job because she's just frankly terrifying. And then Jacob is played, you guys might remember him, as uh, James Delos from Westworld. Uh, and he's a he's a fantastic actor named Peter Mullen. What's your feeling about the cast in general? I, I mean, did they hit a home run with it, or are you kind of underwhelmed? Beautifully cast, and it's surprisingly well cast, because like I said earlier, I'd, if I was going to cast this show, Jason Bateman wouldn't have been on my radar. But I can't imagine it being done any better by anyone else. Jason Bateman's done a world, wonderful job. Laura Linney is amazing in, in the role that she's playing on this. Even the, the children... The the uh, the bird children are doing a great job in their roles. Like everybody from A to Z has done a great job, and and ninety percent of the writing is spot on. And you cannot get a show like anything that's ever been written for television that is a hundred percent. So ninety percent is like right where you need to be. I mean, it, it when you have writing like that, it really kind of 
does the same thing where it makes you more approachable and more human. If you try and do everything to perfection and reshoot everything a hundred times so that you get the absolute perfect stuff, first of all, you're never going to get it though that the ones that you try and match together aren't going to match the earlier scenes just because even if you're using all artificial lighting, it's all going to change anyway, just because everything else is going to change. The I like the little 10% of, I don't know, maybe Ryan would call it lazy writing, but it, it makes it approachable and makes it human. So I when you're 90% on your writing and almost 100% on your acting, how do you get a better show? IG, that awkward moment when the local person you, with drug history that you invest money into her failing business so you can launder it steals from you. I mean, is there no place safe to hide large sums of money if you can't do it in the walls of the cabin of the failing business? Where can you do it? Oh, man. Well, you know, there is no safe place to launder money, and you got to expect someone to steal some of it if that's what you're going to do. You know, you, you expect, you know, the, the, the druggie to turn around and get clean the, the second you put $50 million in the wall, but it's never going to happen. Yeah, Rachel's a really complex character, too. I mean, you want to trust her, you want to like her. She's got a troubled past. They had a little bit of a flirtation in season one, and next thing you know, she steals money out of the wall and just bails. And as if he doesn't have enough going on, IG, they decide that they're going to build a casino with the Snells and the cartel. Marty's pretty cocksure that he's got six months to get it up and running. Would you bet against Marty Bird, or do you think that there's a possibility that we see a casino by the end of the season? Whew, a casino? That's that's big gambling right there. I mean, not not to try and put a pun on it, but that's really taking a chance. Because, I mean, typically, like most places to get a casino, you need to have other things going on. I, now, where they're at, I don't know what the law is, but, you know, they're, they have to get it past the legislature to be able to open it. And that's a lot of palms you got to grease, and I don't know if they can find enough dirty people to grease enough palms to make it happen. Because that's what you're going to need to have happen from just some random dude wanting to start a casino. Because that's what it turns into, is he's a random guy trying to say, Look, let's do this big money-making operation that I can literally launder anything through. Because once you have that casino, laundering money no longer is a problem. I love the cartel's investigation, too, on what happened to Dell. Leads him to that shitty kid behind the counter. Just the slacker, like, you know, the dick with his phone that doesn't even bother to look up. And <laughs> I wasn't upset at all that he got his comeuppance. I digress. IG, the cartel finds out that the Snells killed their man. And despite the bird's plea, the Snells refuse to play ball and placate the cartel. What are your thoughts on the episode and your rating? Well, you know, coming out of, out of season one, this first episode of season two is a strong way to pick it back up. Uh, that Again, the acting was spot on on this first episode. It's beautiful to look at, and there's really starting to get a lot of entry. You know, one of my biggest concerns about any show is when they don't have any motion, when they don't have any movement. And this one definitely has movement, and a lot of it in that first episode. I really, really enjoyed it, and I'm going to give it a nine. I really liked it. It's just a great return for an amazingly written, dark, and gritty show. Ozark is amazing from start to go. It's The cast is great. The writing's great. I just can't wait to see what happens with the rest of the season, and I'm almost through. I can't look at the cast and say there's one week performance. People can compare it to Breaking Bad all they want. It's a fair comparison. I mean, and the quality stands up even though they're only in the second season. I give Reparations a 9. So we all grew up with the Muppets. I mean, we're all around that age. My experience, this is the first adult puppet movie that I can remember. It has the backing of Jim Henson's family. It has a great starring actress in Melissa McCarthy. And it had a pretty good cast. But did the Happy Time murders live up to the hilarious previews that probably made 90% of the people go see it? We're about to find out. The other main character with Melissa McCarthy is a, a puppet. And his name is Phil Phillips. Great writing. Uh, voiced by Bill Beretta, who is a longtime uh, Muppet uh, puppeteer. He's the first and last puppet cup. He's jaded. He's angry. Despite it being a puppet lead, how did you feel about the story? It, did it give that old noir feel? The old school detective type movie? That's exactly the kind of feeling it, it was leading toward. I think it, it missed the mark a little bit. But like it, I could definitely feel that where he had that old... like. 50s and 60s kind of like black and white detective story kind of thing going on. It was it was fun, but it wasn't as fun as it could have been. I think there was a lot of places they could have gone. And I think, you know, seeing things like um, the Lego movies and things like that, where they've taken a child's property and put enough things in it to make adults enjoy it, that's things that they could have done better. 
like they they weren't bad, but they could have done it a lot better. They didn't, I think they needed better writing talent. Like the the ability was there, and like Phil Phillips, like I don't care that they do the alliteration thing because you know what, Stan Lee's done it forever, so that's fine to do that. But yeah, I think they could have done better. But I did get the feeling I I could tell that's what they were shooting for. I hate to be overly negative, and this is probably the thing that we reviewed the most that I've got the hardest feelings on. But that's. I, you know, they they really sold the movie off the back of 30 seconds of humor in the trailer, and they didn't provide much else. But I did like uh, Phil Phillips as a character, even though that he was a puppet. I, I thought that they did give him slightly enough depth to make him, you know, fun and, and watchable. You know, the rest of the puppet, uh, the rest of the puppet characters, not so much. The rest of the Happy Time people weren't around long enough to kind of get any kind of character development. That I did feel. IG, the rivalry and revive partnership between Edwards, who was played by Melissa McCarthy, and the puppet Phil. Was it believable and compelling enough as a side story? Plot was trying to uncover who's killing these these random puppets that nobody seemed to really care about. Well, I think they were trying to push Melissa McCarthy too much into her role from The Heat, if you remember that one with Sandra Bullock. Um, just trying to make her that kind of cop where she's foul-mouthed and dirty and everything else. And I think in this realm, it didn't work as well. But their relationship was still... I mean, as as believable as it can be when you're dealing with puppets, you know, and they, it it was still a little bit fun, but it it they needed to take a little different tack than they took. I think uh, it wasn't awful, but there was so many things that could have been done better. And again, like I said, if, if there's been a bunch of things lately where it's children's properties that they gear toward the entire family that makes it fun to watch. I mean, Disney does it all the time. Pixar does it all the time. These other stu- and this was done out of a smaller studio, and I think that was part of the problem. They needed to get somebody big on board. Well, one of the big things from the promo was the puppet sex scene, which that is one of the few things in the movies that did really deliver with a hilarious silly string ending. And I love the fact that the humans were kind of outside the office, just stuck uh, listening. And it went on way too long, and it was way uh, way too uncomfortable. But it was showed, it, you know, they kind of completely spoiled the moment, and I think it would have been uh, more advantageous to the movie if they wouldn't have put that in the, the trailers. Yeah, totally. I mean, you, when when you waste everything that you've got on the trailer and then people go start seeing the movies, especially in today's world, things are going to travel quickly, right? You know, between Twitter, Facebook, and everything else. Things are going to move way too fast, and, and the word of mouth is going to get out that, like, everything that was funny that was in the trailer is all that's funny that's in the movie. Now, I don't think that's necessarily completely true, but they took the biggest laughs and put them in the trailer, and that that's a problem. Like, they needed to build, like, anticipation without ruining the, the big laughs in the movie, and, and this isn't the only place that's done that. Uh, it's been a, a lot of movies that got a lot of anticipation building up that ended up being all the good stuff was in the in the two minute trailer. And if that's what they're gonna do, then just you know try and sell the two minute trailer, try and monetize that somehow. I don't know how they're gonna do it. I mean, what are they gonna sell it for a nickel? Maybe, but there's options. Well, Phil Bales, he's a suspect in, since he's been in every single murder, and he runs to meet with the only member, female member of the Happy Time Gang, which is Elizabeth Banks. The idea of a human puppet relationship is as it is seems kind of hilarious. And if this was a possibility, would you partake in some rotten cotton if the puppet was attractive enough? There are no strings to hold me down, so you might have to to take that around for a spin at least once, just to to brag to your buddies about the experience. You got to got to give everything one kind of shot, right? I mean, the the world has started changing where there's all kinds of activities the youngins are doing these days that us older people are like, "You're doing what?" Uh, no. I don't want any part of that. But, you know, a little rotten cotton, that could work. One of the most off-putting things about the movie was that Leslie David Baker is Lieutenant ben in, uh, Banning in the movie. And we all know him, at least on the podcast, as Stanley Hudson from The Office. And he had more dialogue in this movie than he had in the eight seasons of The Office. Ha- hearing him putting paragraphs of dialogue together was kind of off-putting to me. IG, w- what did you think of his performance? And was it a little weird to hear him say more than three words? Yeah, the the uh, the fact that he was speaking so much was, was weird because... Really, all I've all I remember seeing him in and and saying anything is the office. 
because he he was such a pivotal part. Now most of the time it was single or double word answers while he played his crossword puzzles, but now we get this whole like diatribe of stuff out of him. So it wasn't it wasn't poorly done, and I think he kind of played that whole angry lieutenant thing pretty well. But it was still strange watching Stanley act that way. I, I enjoyed it, though. It was still a good time. Yeah, it really was. And it was neat to see him in something else. And uh, a lot of those office people, I don't know if they'll ever work again because they've showed no depth of acting. Uh, you know, most of them are even named what their character names are. Um, so it's <laughs> nice to see them, you know, when they pop up in other places, uh, even if it's on somebody's Tinder feed. We get to the point where basically Phil is being blamed essentially because he's just a puppet. And uh, he took the heat for the missed shot at the suspect and his partner getting hit with shrapnel. Is it right? to kind of blame people more for who they are or what they are uh, rather than their actions. Did that kind of, even though he was a puppet, did it bother you a little bit to see him take that much heat? Yeah, this is one of those instances where they ham-fisted like social justice at you a little bit because it, it parallels to the things that have happened in the world for quite some time now. Is it right to do it just because somebody's a puppet? Absolutely not. Just like it's not right to do it based on anybody's sex or religion or race or anything else. But, it, it you know, when they're all thought of as a lower class of citizen, like one of them was standing outside of a building singing songs for change because that's what puppets do. It just, there were stereotypes that were real in the movie and stereotypes that were holding off on the movie. And... So it really makes it a hard decision to say, is it right to do it or not? But generally, no, it's not right to to blame somebody. And it, has there ever been a cop that missed a shot? Well, about 90% of them have missed a shot when they've taken one. That's why they shoot so many times when they actually tend to take out their guns. The they'll, they'll, average cop, I think, shoots somewhere between 10 and 15 rounds at any time they pull out their weapon and fire a shot. It's a lot of shots that come out because most of them don't hit what they're supposed to. And this guy fired one shot and didn't hit what he was supposed to and tragically hit something else. And now he there can be no more puppet police officers or anything else. And that leads into, like, what if our police force in the United States was all white? That would be problematic, wouldn't it? So, yeah, I see the problem. On the way out to talk to the final survivors, they turn on the radio and that's what Friends Are For comes on the radio and causes uh, Melissa McCarthy's character to shoot it. Is there one song that you're trapped in the car with somebody that you're not sure of that would cause you to shoot your radio. Oh man. Like, I don't know. Like that, that, um, that girl is bananas song from pink or whatever. B A N A N A S. I just want to strangle things. Isn't that the, is that, that's Gwen Stefani, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, that That's what it is. Yeah. I can't stand it. It makes, it makes me want to just choke people. I don't know why. Like that song comes on, and I'm like, "All right, let's go." To me, it's uh, those older R&B, well, early '90s songs like uh, "Color Me Bad," "I'm Gonna Sex You Up," or anything from Boys to Men. It just makes my skin crawl because it's Bell so Bip damn Demo. douchey. <laughs> oh yeah, well, Poison's not that terrible of a song. I would, uh, I would get down to some Poison, but uh, the rest of that stuff I could definitely do without. Ig, towards the end of the movie, Melissa McCarthy's character ends up quitting the police force. And she basically just lets everyone have it and tells them what uh, what she thinks of them. From should have slept with you, didn't want to sleep with you, hated you. Did it remind you of uh, Gilmore Diaz's quote, uh, quitting his job and half baked? Fuck you, fuck you, fuck you. You're cool. I'm out. Yeah, and the, I love half baked. Half baked is such a such a fun movie, and it's so underrated. Like. It didn't get good playing the theaters when it came out. It it's become a little bit of a cult classic. And if you have not seen Half Baked, it's like Dave Chappelle at his finest, along with a, a group of other people, and it, they're all wonderful in that whole movie. And the best, like if I ever quit another job, I'm totally quitting like that, you know, where I'm gonna go down the list. And you know, unfortunately, I work with like. 65 people so it's going to take a few minutes to get through but. you're gonna have to go to other buildings and get on the radio <laughs> and maybe rent one of those planes with the uh, trail behind sign behind it um well you know the the big thing now is uh radio djs and podcasters quitting in the middle of a show so you could always pull that off it would take you all three seconds to just turn off your computer and walk away so ig in the end uh the big reveal was that Another puppet was responsible for the murders, and she was in cahoots with his girlfriend. And, I mean, did you really care? Was it much of a payoff? Did you see it coming from 100 miles away? Oh, it was coming from, like, 
from the very beginning of the movie, like when that girl that that girl puppet showed up in that office, I had it pegged. It was like, uh, yeah, she's she's the one. That's her. Like it was because it was formulaic. I mean, I don't think it was supposed to be a big surprise. I don't think it was supposed to be a big thing, right? It's it's the the whole detective noir st- series type things, right? So it had to be the femme fatale that you know just happened to be a puppet. So, yeah, it was coming from, like, there was no surprise to it. I knew it was going to come. And I think they didn't pay it off even as well as they should have. And that's the problem they came up with is they could have made it funnier. Like, yeah, we knew you did it. We were just waiting for you to, like, do it so we could watch. Yeah, something. There's some way they could have made it better, and they, they missed the mark on that. Well, and out of 10, what would you give the movie? What What would your final thoughts and review of the movie be? You know, seriously, I think I'd still give it a six. It was still wow. It was a still six, kind of funny. I. It was still kind of funny, and it was still kind of fun to watch. Like puppets, like out, like and they were like straight up Muppets. Like they looked like Muppets. They had the same kind of eyes and everything. Seeing them out of the the different things, it worked a little bit. And so, like, I would watch it again. So I think I'd give it a six. There just wasn't anything there. The reveal didn't pay off. The movie didn't. There was no character development. Uh, I didn't. You know, they didn't make me care about. You know, uh, I walk. I didn't walk out of this thinking puppet puppets lives matter. I, I don't care if any of them ever becomes a cop again. And the buzz around this movie was it was supposed to spring into a franchise if it did well. Thank God that's never going to happen because I think it made about 13 bucks because anybody that saw this probably didn't pay to see it. They showed everything in the trailer. Everything that was worthwhile in the movie, they showed. I don't know who wrote this. I don't know who's responsible for it, but they owe people $13 back. Uh, It's probably the worst rating I've ever given anything that we reviewed because I went into this really wanting to like it. I wanted it to be something different and something fun, and uh, I I wanted kind of more of it because it's just something out of the box that you don't see every day. And I'm going to give it a three. Three is rough, man. I thought I was being super generous. I thought you'd at least be at a four or something. My goodness. Now, nothing could save it. I mean, Melissa McCarthy did what she could with it, but I don't find her that endearing to begin with. I just... uh, you know, she's good in small doses. I don't think she's a lead character in the movie. She's kind of the, the, the friend at most. And it looks like she gained most of that weight back, which is unfortunate because she was looking halfway decent. You got any news stories, IG? You know, I like The Rock, so we're going to do another Rock story. We had one last week. Let's do another one. So uh, apparently, Dwayne The Rock Johnson gets irritated when people ask him how he slept. Because they all want <laughs> to say that he slept like a rock. And so he's he's put out a couple of things. Just He he, he responded to some people's tweets like, will you people please stop asking me that? that you know, Because uh, that came out of Shower Thoughts on Reddit. And he's, he's, he's irritated. He, he responded to that saying, yeah, um, people need to stop asking me that. That's actually worse than last time when somebody's 100 straight days trying to trying to get in touch with him and say, hey, hang out with me. You know, like, people just, hey, how'd you sleep, Rock? <laughs> there are some funny stuff out there, and I don't know if the people are really responding on Twitter or not, but they'll they'll do a thing where they, you know, they'll make a Mr. Potato Head look like a celebrity, and they'll respond, would you please stop fucking doing this? Which always cracks me up because it always looks like the celebrity. I, I, I love that. It's kind of a lame joke, and I'm surprised that he even responded to it. So my next one comes out of Kuwait. This is great, all right? A, 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 a store in Kuwait has recently been shut down after it was discovered that the owners were sticking googly eyes on their fresh fish to make them appear fresher. That happened. They're a coastal place, but they have a small coast, so their fishing probably isn't all that great, so they're probably bringing in a lot of their stuff, importing, because they only have a small area into the sea there. Yeah, they were taking googly eyes, putting them on the fish's eyes, slapping them into the packages, and then trying to sell them. And then apparently some of the googly eyes were sliding off, and people were taking pictures of them, and yeah, they got shut down. I think that's hilarious. That's kind of a lot like Homer Simpson wearing those glasses with the eyes on them to appear awake during jury duty. I mean, where do you go that you can just pick up fish and shake them to see how lifelike they are? They're supposed to be dead. Uh, you know, I don't want this fish because its eyes are too dead. I don't get the purpose behind that, and I'm not sure why anybody would actually be offended by it. It would probably be pretty silly. So we always got to have a story from Florida. 
and I've got one here. You know, there, there's a family in Florida that recently has been terrorized by a six foot, hundred pound lizard chasing them outside of their house. The Lieberman family in Florida, like they went outside one day and they walk them by the sliding glass door and she screamed because re- looked outside and lo and behold, Godzilla's smaller cousin was sitting right there. It was alarming and terrifying to his wife and kids. And yeah, Florida. Like, and it's not like it's a, a, a crocogator or an alligyle or whatever. It's an actual, like, like a monitor, like a big lizard hanging around Southern Florida. Well, if there's one thing that I won't put up with is an anti-Semitic reptile. Leave the Liebermans <laughs> alone. I'm sure that they have enough problems down there. They don't need you going and trying to eat them. I don't know, Ryan, is this a lot like the alligators in the sewers in New York City? Florida has a problem with this. It's not just uh, just not uh, alligators in the area, but it is people buying these uh, large exotic snakes or these lizards and just letting them go. And it really is a problem. And you even hear as much of people just dumping their piranha in, in small lakes and ponds and stuff. Maybe a little prior planning when you go out and buy these animals that, that if you're I mean, hand them over to the Amin Society, uh, you know, just don't release them into the wild where they can cause havoc and maybe, you know, stomp on buildings a few months down the road. All right, last story. All right, this is going to just send Canadian tourism through the roof. A sex doll brothel is coming to Toronto. That's right. You too, for the low, low price of somewhere between 60 and $742, can go into a nondescript building somewhere in Toronto and do your business with a sex doll that they they promise will be sanitized after every customer. Yeah, I don't know if I'm buying that they're they're sanitizing it after every customer because I think some of them come with detachable body parts that you need to put in the the dishwasher. So I'm not quite sure that uh, the old uh, Windex and rub is going to really work things out, and who knows what communicable diseases you can get off of plastic after it's been used by multiple people. I would much prefer to see people pay for sex than try to take it from somebody that doesn't want it. The only benefit that I, I could see one of these places having is that if you're in the market for this type of thing, you get to try it out for probably you know a couple hundred bucks rather than a couple thousand. I mean, back when those things first came out, I think Real Doll puts them out. Howard Stern had one in his studio forever, and they were like ten thousand dollars. So get the ability to kind of, and I don't think there was returns on yeah, them. Yeah, no. So to, you can't to, return if you're it. if you're interested, it might be worth the trip over to the brothel just to try it out before you you know invest uh, the the price of a compact car on a sex doll that you may only have sex with once, which is a lot like a lot of relationships, and then it just ends up costing you a lot of money. Yeah, I'm happy that Fall TV is back because we have a lot of different content coming out. I mean, The Purge, The Mayans, there's a lot of great TV shows coming out, so I'm excited about that. I mean, we get this Netflix stuff and we go through it in in a week or two, but some of the series and, and TV shows coming back excite me, and we're going to be reviewing them. IG and I will be doing instant reaction shows after every Fear the Walking Dead and Walking Dead episode this season, so you can either find it on my page or the uh, the Underground fan group, and uh, I'd like to thank the, the cast of the Fear of the Walking Dead because they've been amazing on my Instagram this week. We also have a lot of big interviews uh, lined up over the next couple months, and that all leads us into The Walking Dead in October. So uh, we've got a lot of big things coming up. Yeah, it's really exciting. You'd like you have to come back and see what we've got to say about some of these things because there are some great movies and TV shows. And like we're going to give you something to look at. So there's always something new with the Cynic Radio podcast, and we can't wait to bring it to you. That's right. So contact us at the show at cynicradio.com, on Facebook, Cynic Radio, Twitter, Instagram, all them places. And until next time, IG. Don't get captured. Follow the podcast on Twitter, Facebook, and at CynicRadio.com. Available for download on iTunes.